John 14, and I'll just read verses 15 to 20, and then verses 25 to 26. Of course, you find some more concerning the Holy Spirit in the next chapter. I find there's so much about the Holy Spirit in the Scriptures. It's quite incredible the neglect that has taken place over the centuries about the person of the Holy Spirit. How easily the Church has fallen into the error of thinking that the Holy Spirit is only an influence, only a kind of power. That as you switch on a light, electricity will cause power to be manifested in light. So we think that the operations of God are just the kind of power of God being manifest and we've forgotten or neglected all through the centuries uh, that the Holy Spirit is just as real a person as the Lord Jesus or the Father. I'm not, uh, not sure if I'm allowed to make a statement by John Calvin, the great theologian in a place like this, but I'll risk making it. Profound theologian that he was, he made this observation. He said the chief sin of the people of God in the Old Testament was their rejection of the dispensation of God the Father. They didn't want God. You remember all those teaching in the Old Testament, they wouldn't have the governance of God over them, always going away from him. They rejected God the Father. The chief sin of the people of God in the days of the flesh of the Lord Jesus was their rejection of God the Son. They didn't want him. And then he said this. The chief sin of the church in all ages is its continued rejection of the Holy Spirit. Two great men, Dr. A. W. Tozer, and approximately at the same time, I'm quite certain without any collusion, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones in London. And a century before, another man of already quoted C.H. Spurgeon made exactly the same statement, the same observation, almost word for word. Tozer, Martin Lloyd-Jones, Spurgeon said it was their conviction that in the majority of cases... The Holy Spirit could be taken away from the church and he would not be missed. Things would continue as they were before. Now isn't this challenging? See, you don't have to have the Holy Spirit to preach a sermon. You can get books. You can apply yourself. You can apply the mind and get a structure together and you can give a lecture. They call it a sermon. You don't have to have the Holy Spirit to have a service like this. You can come and sing hymns. You don't have to have the Holy Spirit. In fact, I was so convinced in law that the Holy Spirit was not in that meeting. I've often wondered if I did the right thing, but I had an immediate, deep conviction that God wasn't there, and this came with such power that I put up my hand and pronounced the benediction and stopped the meeting in a moment. The meeting was shut. I remember dear Geoffrey King, who's a, uh, a very well-known preacher in Britain, but quite a character, a man of a law to himself, and he started preaching, and someone moved in the service, moved down the aisle, and he became aware that here was a congregation that were not conscious of God, and without any hesitation, he stepped back and he slammed the Bible, the congregation sat up. But he had gone. No Holy Spirit. And so I do believe we're living in days of tremendous neglect of the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't ask you to accept, and I'm sure you don't, that the kind of oracle has spoken if I've made a, a, an observation about the Holy Spirit. I might be totally wrong. That one branch of the Church of Jesus Christ is afraid of the Holy Spirit. Afraid of the Holy Spirit. And partly afraid of the Holy Spirit because the other half or some segment, whatever the proportion is of the church, so often have an overemphasis and a, a kind of um, perverted teaching of the Holy Spirit that makes the rest of the church afraid of the Holy Spirit. I've been in meetings without any hesitation. I say, if that's the Holy Spirit, I don't want anything to do with that. 
But of course I didn't believe it was the Holy Spirit. You can get a lot of madness and a lot of flesh that's put down to the operation of the Holy Spirit. And yet, and yet I believe with all my heart that what we need preeminently above everything else is the Holy Spirit. Now I feel I want to speak tonight having looked at the entire cleansing by the removal of sins by the Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus. How a soul would cry, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me, that it's only that spirit, that right spirit, that free spirit, that willing spirit, is the Holy Spirit. And I want to look at the Holy Spirit. I want to say what kind of relationship and this is largely then a meeting tonight to edification. What is the relationship of the Holy Spirit to the believer? Let me get one thing cleared away, because I'll not be referring to this. When I speak about believers, they are people who already are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. I see there are 14 passages, we haven't got time to look for them this evening, 14 passages where the writers of the New Testament assume or teach clearly that every believer has the Holy Spirit. We just turn to one of them, the Lord Jesus. He would send the Spirit to them whom the world couldn't receive. Paul would even address himself to the carnal Corinthians as those who still were indwelt by the Holy Spirit, that they were the temples of God, that the Spirit of God dwelt in them, which they had of God, that God walketh about in them. They were indwelt by the Holy Spirit. They were the temples of the Holy Spirit. So every believer has the Holy Spirit. And Paul says in Romans 8 and verse 9, If any man hath not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. This is the mark, this is the seal, whereby the Lord knoweth them that are his. His own secret sign, they have the Holy Spirit. Yes. Ah, but then, what relationship? What relationship does the Holy Spirit sustain and continue to those in whom he indwells? And I want to move along fairly quickly this evening, because I want to say seven things, if I may, if I can get round to it, on this relationship of the Holy Spirit to the believer. Even though we already are born again of the Holy Spirit, which we have of God, we are now the temples of the Holy Spirit, he is still a gift to be received. Some of us are too clever by half. We've got some wonderful British theologians. And they delight, it seems to me, to go into the pulpit, to attend the convention, and then they'll emphasize, they'll bring out the truth that we have the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is a person, and you can't have a bit of a person. If you have the Holy Spirit as a person, he's in you as a person, you have everything at regeneration, there's nothing more for you to seek after or to look after. And we hear this so many times these days in the British Isles, even in conventions that were established to preach the need of the fullness of the Holy Spirit, there are now in too many cases more sermons that deny and mock the whole teaching of the possibility of a second work of grace than the men who are there to preach what the convention has been raised up for. You see, there is a seeming in contradiction in the Bible. We have the Spirit, and we have him as a person. We become, when we are born again, our bodies become the temples of the Holy Ghost. But to those who already have the Spirit, the New Testament still speaks. It says, now you must receive the Spirit. Now that does seem to be a contradiction. And, and so the work of the Spirit is, is so often used in this twofold way. We experience him in the new birth, but we are then to receive him. And without any doubt, the New Testament speaks and urges upon believers the need of receiving the Holy Spirit as a gift. My first point is this, he's a gift to be received. Just by the way, I know some of you are interested in the background of Calvinism and so on. You know, the Puritans almost unanimously agreed that you had all the Holy Spirit in regeneration. Two of them stood out against it. One of them was the t famous Thomas Goodwin. The famous uh, John Goodwin. Uh, the namesake, but no relation to the other, John Goodwin. John Goodwin was a deep Calvinist. Thomas Goodwin was much more balanced 
I declared my position. Uh, Thomas Goodwin was much more scriptural. And he saw, and he saw, that although we were born again of the Spirit, there was still something else the New Testament urges. And he saw this so clearly that when he wrote his great book on New Matologia, The Fullness of the Spirit, he longed, and he spent about 660 pages, about a year's ministry on preaching in Ephesians 5.18, be filled with the Spirit, but almost everyone else was against him. John Goodwin, actually his namesake in this great work, uh, Thomas Goodwin in his great commentary on Ephesians when he comes to verse 1 chapter 1 and verse 13 he saw with, 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 with John Goodwin the need of this and the passion with which he writes that believers should sue God that's his phrase sue God for the gift of the Holy Spirit can I ask you a question have you ever heard or yourself asked someone the question have you received the Lord Jesus Christ as your saviour? You say, oh yes. I've often tested I've received Christ as my saviour. Well, that's all right. Because three times in the New Testament, we have the phrase about receiving Christ. For instance, John 1, 12, to as many as received him. To them he gave power to become the sons of God. Mark 9, 37, he took a child and set him in the midst and said, Whosoever receiveth, such receiveth me. Colossians 2 and verse 6, As you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. So three times we are told that we have received Christ. 130 odd times we are commanded to believe in the Lord Jesus. Although it's biblical to say I've received Christ, it's more biblical to say I believe. I am in an act of trusting and believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. But now when we come to the Holy Spirit, now I hope you're listening. Because you're living amongst neighbours and they think you're a bit of a religious crank. You belong to this, real, this pilgrim holiness church. You believe in a second work of grace. And my, if you listen to them, you think the Bible is altogether silent about a believer receiving the Holy Spirit, even though he has the Holy Spirit. Well, listen to this. Nineteen times in the New Testament, believers are addressed in terms of receiving the Spirit. And let me tell you something else. I've got these references down there. I wish I had time to read them out to you. But time is flying past. Not only... Do 19 times do we have this phrase addressed to believers to receive the Spirit? But I might just enlighten you on another point. There were two words in the, in the Greek for receiving. There was the word dekomai. For instance, yesterday I received a letter from my wife. Nobody even shouted, praise the Lord. Well, I did. But I received it passively. Down the bottom of the stairs in the cardboard box, there was a letter waiting for me and I picked it up. Passively. I didn't kick open the door. I didn't grasp hold of that postman. I didn't seize hold of the letters and wrestle it from him. It was there. Decomai. That was the common, the usual word for receiving. There was another word, a very rare word, not very often used. It's the word lambano. That word means to seize, to arrest to take hold of, to apprehend. Now I confess to you, you'd have thought that in almost certainty the word that Paul would have used would be in the word decomai. You passively receive the Spirit. There you are as a believer, you're looking to the Lord, and you just wait as the Spirit. But even before I came to this service, I went into this study here, and there was the famous Grimm and Fair's Greek lexicon. Look up the word lambano. To seize, lay hold of, arrest, apprehend. These are the words for taking hold of the Holy Spirit. Do you know what is wrong with me? Say, your trouble with you is you're Welsh. And being Welsh, I wanted, if you like, a kind of Pentecostal manifestation. Everything in me, emotionally goes along with a Pentecostal interpretation. I want an experience that I can feel a kind of, you know, a thousand volt shock going up and down my vine and if there's a couple of visions thrown in, I dance all, all the more with my feet and jump all the higher. But I'm compelled by my knowledge of the word of God that you don't passively wait 
until the Spirit falls upon you. You're to take the Holy Spirit. He's a gift to be received. A dear lady said to me last week, we were standing in the aisle of a church, and she quite openly just said, you know, Mr. Crossman, I've prayed for over 20 years for the Holy Spirit. And I felt it was right to say to her, the atmosphere was very sweet, and I didn't feel she would take exception. I said, well, madam, I, I think you've waited 20 years too long. She said, how? And so we began to talk together, and some of the ladies were rather informed, you know, and then she stopped me. She said, Mr. Crossman, I'm taking the Holy Spirit right now. I'm taking the Holy Spirit right now. You know, I think a marriage service is very delightful. I suppose I've conducted hundreds of them. Do you take this man to be thy lawful wedded husband? Do you take him? She says, I do. Do you take this woman to be your lawful wedded wife to have and to hold from this day forward forevermore? I do. They take. They take. My brother, a seaman, I wonder what the minister would do because the constitution, the law of England said he has to say, I do. But being a sailor, he says, I, I. The minister didn't mind. You take. You take. Wouldn't it be a tremendous act of faith? Wouldn't it be an amazing demonstration of the presence of God, the reality of his truth in a meeting, if you said, you know, I can take the Holy Spirit right now. I don't have to wait for a transaction at the front. I don't have to wait for a certain frame. Do you know, I wonder if this will offend you. To take the Holy Spirit in cold faith. I believe my mother-in-law saw more demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit than probably many women in this generation. She was in the midst of that revival in Lisuland where her husband was the missionary that was used. She worked with Mary Monson, Jonathan Gopher. She was in the midst of the sweeping revivals there in the East. And what a manifestation of the power of God. And yet, you know, with all her culture, she said, Douglas, you take the Holy Spirit by cold faith. Naked faith. A.B. Simpson put it this way, I take the promised Holy Ghost to fill me to the uttermost. Say I'd a treasure that you want. I collect gemstones and I collect old holiness books and so on. And last week a man came... And he handed me an envelope at the close of the meeting. We had been speaking together in the week, and I felt this. I said, I know it's easy, but I said, don't open it, it's for you. You know, I knew that it was. It was a piece of agate slab, a quarter of an inch thick of agate slab. He is giving me as a present. What if he had said, would you like to have this agate slab? I, I, I said, yes, I would. I'd love that in my collection. Then take it. Oh, I'm th I, I, I want that. Then take it. Oh, I want that then take it. You know, after 20 years, he's getting a bit bored with this chap Crossman. <laughs> I took the Holy Ghost. I took the Holy Ghost. And then the devil said to me, didn't have a scrap of feeling, didn't have any visions, nor hear any voices, nor feel any thrill. All I knew is that God spoke very directly, and he says, I'm shutting you up to your own ministry. You take the Holy Spirit by faith. I almost feel I'd like to come down to ask every one of you very pointedly here tonight, very simply, are you a Christian? Say, yes, I am. You believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? Yes, I do. I say, well, have you as a believer taken, seized hold of, grasped, apprehended, arrested the Holy Spirit? That's what it is. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Acts 2.42. A gift to be received. When my youngest daughter, Sharon, was a cuddly little baby, I remember giving her some pre presents, and she, she, more than the other three children, always was so engrossed with the trappings. I remember once we gave her a little Christmas present that was wrapped in some kind of 
coloured, uh, transparent paper, you know, and we gave her the present, and you know that, that wrapping paper, it thrilled her no end. She never even opened the box of the present, it was this paper. Just like so many Christians, isn't it? How does he come? Will I feel? Will I see? Will I have this gift or that gift? What wrapping does it come? I say this most reverently, it doesn't matter how he comes. Oh, the way that Duncan Campbell used to preach when preaching a revival, the different way that he comes. I remember him, he stopped preaching. And he cried, Lord, let it come from the east or from the north or from the south or from the west. But my God, come. Come as you will and come from where as you will as long as you can. Don't you start laying down conditions as to how you receive the gift. If only you go to ask for it, says Jesus, Luke Lem. Luke 11, 30, 11 and verse 13 and he'll give you the Holy Spirit he's given to all who ask this is most challenging I don't know if I'm going to get to the seven observations but I just want to get this the Holy Spirit by faith he's a gift to be received and he's a guest that remains one of the amazing things the Lord Jesus declared in that passage I read to you in John 14 and verse 16. He suddenly staggered those disciples and said, He shall remain with you forever. You know the Spirit was given to individuals in the Old Testament. How he came upon Samson, how he came upon David, how he came upon Jephthah, how he came upon Bezalel, how he came upon Saul. For how long? For varying durations until the work which God had given them to do was accomplished and the Spirit was withdrawn. In every case in the Old Testament, the Spirit was withdrawn when the work was done. It was always given for a purpose. Ah, but there's this difference in this new dispensation, said Jesus. I will send him unto you and he will remain with you forever. A guest that remains. Do you know what your pastor said to me when I arrived? He says, I'm glad to see you. And when I leave, I'm glad to see the back of you. Ask him. Ask if he wants to be there for the next 60 years. Oh, Crossman for 60 years. Hey. But when it comes to the Holy Spirit, isn't this wonderful? Isn't this wonderful? He's here. He's here. Praise him. And I know he's here. And he'll be with me tomorrow. And the next day. And the next day. I'll send him unto you. And he will remain with you forever. We can grieve him. We can quench him. We can frustrate his workings. And we'll have to repent and ask again that he would have mercy. And come and refill us. But if we're obedient. If we don't grieve and quench. We can always be confident that we have the Holy Spirit I wonder if you can suspect how nervous some preachers are about some of their assignments oh the dreadful contemplation of what you have to do do I remember the story of the famous evangelical bishop, Bishop Taylor Smith I think it was over here in the States in one of his visits and there was a vast crowd and one of the other preachers said how can you face them how can you do it And the bishop looked at him and said reverently, I believe in the Holy Ghost. I believe in the Holy Ghost. He is the enabler. He will remain with you forever. Have you ever stopped to ponder an amazing truth in Romans 8 and verse 11? You know, I think I'll read this to you. It's a very perplexing statement. But what a statement to analyze. Paul says, if the Spirit, and when he uses the phrase, if the Spirit, he knew that the Spirit was in them. He says, assuming, he says, that you're a Christian and you have the Holy Spirit, if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken or give life to your mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwelleth in you. Here's the cause of the resurrection, says Paul. Because of the indwelling Holy Spirit that's in us. He's a guest that remains. The Holy Spirit is a gift 
to be received. Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? He is a guest that remains. Are you conscious that you have the Holy Ghost? Do you know the old German word for the Holy Ghost? By which we mean the spirit, the soul of someone that's departed, but the Holy Guest. That's why Brengel wrote his famous book on the Holy Spirit. He called the Holy Guest because that's his title. He's the Holy Guest. We've got a guest who lives and who stays with us. And Jesus said it's better to have the Holy Spirit in us as a guest than to have him physically in our midst. You might say, oh, I wish Jesus was here tonight. Oh, I'd look at him sitting in that pew. I'd love to see the Lord Jesus. No, said Jesus, there's something better. Better than me sitting in your midst. Better than me sitting at your table. Better than me walking at your side. It's better to have the Holy Spirit in you. See, I don't understand that. That's what Jesus taught and said. Why did he then? If I might say very quickly, he comes a gospel to relay. The Spirit will come, says the Lord Jesus in Acts 1.8. And you shall be my witnesses. There'll be a spreading of the gospel. You know, I love to think that Christians would become aware of the responsibility that we have. I wonder if our danger tonight, you know, we love our services, we sing the hymns, we listen to the word, and we sometimes lose the sense of responsibility that we have even to tell our neighbors. I find that hard to witness. Yet, this is why I'm going to send the Spirit. I want you to relay the gospel. In the old days, they'd have a man on top of this mountain top and a man on that top of that mountain top. And even before the helioscope, they would have this mirror and they would flash a message from mountain to mountain. And God has left with us the commission of the gospel. We should relay it, not only from shore to shore and from nation to nation, but from neighbor to neighbor. Sometimes it's easier to send money for it to be relayed overseas than it is to do it amongst our own kind and amongst our own people. But the Holy Spirit is given the gospel to relay. It's got to be the outworking. My father was a miner. Left the mines later, but we always had a fire in our home, a coal fire, on the hottest day of the world, of the, of the year. Whatever the heat with, there'd still be a coal fire. When I, I met an Englishwoman, who later I married, she'd never met this Welsh custom before, and we said to the, the home we were in, when I went home, she said, well, why do you have a coal fire on a day like this? He looked at it, he said, well, for company, I suppose. I to have a coal fire. But I remember my father coming in, you know, the fire had gone down on a cold day and he'd put in the poker. See, there was no through draft. As long as he just held everything itself together, all its ashes, there was no combustion, there was no heat. As long as we try to keep everything into ourselves, there's no through operation of the Holy Spirit and relaying to others, we lose it. We have, we have to be willing to relay the gospel which has been given to us, however hard it might seem. Now, I don't want you to do that crudely and bluntly. There's a way that everything should be done. By the way, there's a man in Australia. And I heard this story. My successor in Bath who's taken over the church where I was the pastor is Peter Culver. He was a naval commander. And he went to New Zealand with his ship one day and he was walking through Sydney I believe in Australia and a little man stepped out in front of him and said you are going to hell and ran out of the way but he couldn't get away from that you are going to hell that is the bluntest the most aggressive way of witnessing this is all this man did you are going to hell and in one meeting in Britain some time ago Peter Culver was giving his testimony Another person was giving his testimony, and yet another person, three of them in one meeting, what a remarkable coincidence, came to the Lord because this funny little man pointed a finger at them and said, you are going to hell, and then scuttled away. And then I heard that some time ago, Francis Dixon on his travels out there found 14 men, all who'd come to Christ through this man. He said, I'm going to track down this man. And so he found it where he lived, and went to that home in Sydney and knocked at the door and the man came to the door and said, I'd like to speak with you. And went in, he says, I'm Francis Dixon. He said, I don't suppose you know me. He says, oh, I know you very well. I get your Bible readings from London and from, from England and your tapes. And Well, said Francis Dixon, I'm glad you know because I've come to speak to you. I, I've been meeting so many people that have been led to Christ through and I thought I'd like to meet you. 
And I was told the story that the man just began to cry. He says, Mr. Dixon, I'm a backslider. I'm a backslider. I don't witness in the open air now. I don't go out. I felt my life was nothing. And so I gave it all up. And you know, we'll never know until we get to heaven how many have come to the Lord through the ministry of that man. Francis Dixon, I understand, led him back to the Lord as the story I've heard. Isn't that amazing? He was relaying the gospel in the crudest way. I'm not advocating that. He couldn't do it any other way, that dear little man. You've got more intelligence than him, more abilities. A friend of mine, Maynard James, published an article some time ago in the flame. You may have read it. He came across this lady in Australia. You know, it's an affliction set in in the leg and she had a... we can rely on didn't Jesus promise in John 16 and verse 13 he will guide you into all the truth are you any good at sums I had to ask two men here the other day if they had pocket calculators I don't have a pocket calculator I know how many pockets I've got already oh good you, you, you're awake there I wanted a little sum couldn't you say to me, why did you want two men to bother with a calculator to do a simple sum? You've got the Holy Spirit, haven't you? Isn't he the truth? Didn't he say he'd guide you into all truth? Couldn't he tell you how many ten tens, how many times ten tens are? Ah, oh, yes, he could. He could reveal a tremendous, and I do believe he is revealing a tremendous amount of things to people. There's a man over here that's been supporting the work of God most generously over, over his life. And I was speaking to him some time ago, he's not an engineer, but he's got an engineering construction company. And he makes complicated machinery. He said, you know, my brother, he says, I've always had a blueprint given to me when I'm lying in bed. And he showed me a mock-up in wood of this new machine he was desi designing. He's taken it to the engineers, and the expert said, it can't be done, it can't work. He says, but they've said this about every other one of my machines. He said, and this one will work as well, because I know this is what the Holy Spirit has been doing all through my life, is showing me how it should be done. And I accepted that testimony fully. I see the evidence in his machine shop. I see the money he's made for the Lord, the way the Lord has blessed him. So I believe this is what the Spirit has done. He's guided him into that area of knowledge for his own purposes. But I cannot teach that the Holy Spirit will do that for you. You can now go and be a, a surgeon and start cutting people up tomorrow. And the Spirit will show you which parts to take out and which parts to sew back in. I dare not say that. But I can guarantee this. Allow the Holy Spirit to have his way and you'll know at least for salvation. Apart from any human teaching, you'll know that Jesus is the Son of God. This is how we know. You'll know the Bible is the Word of God. You'll know that on the cross he died an atoning death for your sins. Don't you think it's incredible? You're sitting there tonight. If I said to you, what do you think about Jesus Christ? You say he was the Son of God that came to earth from heaven, died on the cross for my sins, and I know I'm saved. You could have gone to a slave in Rome in the first century and say, tell me what you think about the Lord Jesus. They say, I know that Jesus, the Son of God, who's come from heaven to earth and died on the cross for my sins and I know I'm saved. And this has been the unanimous teaching of the Holy Spirit to every Christian all through the centuries. Do you know why I, one of the great reasons why I have to reject in general the present charismatic movement? It is because I'm being asked to believe that the Holy Spirit is showing something now which he's never done before. That I listen to a testimony and the person says, the Holy Spirit gave me a greater veneration. I have to say, stuff and nonsense. Stuff and nonsense. The person says, I've come into a deeper appreciation of the Mass. I say, ridiculous. This is contrary to all we know of the person and the work of the Spirit in Scripture and in history. He will exalt Jesus. He will glorify Jesus. He will reveal the truths of these words, especially to do with our salvation. I hope I'm wrong, 
But in 1923, the Reverend Charles Brown went, as he was always doing, taking special meetings, and he went to a place called East Anglia in Britain and began to preach, but suddenly the whole town was in the grip of the Holy Spirit. They came from all the churches of the area in the town, and the crowds were just the saints of God. And for a time, you know, they were lifted up to heaven upon earth, as it were. And then everything faded away. And a famous Bible teacher, a dear friend of mine, Paul Tucker, I was talking to him some time ago, and I said, Paul, how do you explain the winding up, the breaking up of that great revival that commenced in 1923? Oh, he says, I can tell you. He said, you know, the Baptist Union, that was one denomination, approached the Reverend Charles Brown and undertook to pay him to be their special evangelist that the converts should be channeled into Baptist churches and Baptist churches should be built out of the revival movement. From that point there was no revival. Now I happen to believe in believers' baptism. But the moment an organization and a man came together Virtue and give me money or I'll take your money and I'll make this a Baptist revival. The Holy Ghost says, oh no you don't. I'm not here to build up the Baptists or the Pilgrim Holiness nor the Presbyterians. It's the saints of God. And he'll only glorify Jesus. Which might ought to lead me on this where the Spirit guides us into the truths of the Lord Jesus. Do you remember how we were reminded in this solo by Mrs. Shillington? How the change that came, the transformation and the glory that came in. Yet some of us, you know, as we listen to that and we turn to the word of God and I come to my point. He comes a glory to reveal. But don't we sometimes, as we take our spiritual pulse, say, I'm not seeing very much of the glory. I know there are times that there might be an outworking of this. Uh, if I might refer to Duncan Campbell again, I was with him in a meeting and he suddenly stopped. And what came across was the reality of it. He said to the congregation, I wish I could show you the blaze of glory that's burning on my soul at this moment. And yet it seems so real, one could almost sense it coming from the man. But he said, you know, that isn't my usual sense of feeling. Yet this is what he's come to do. This is what he's come to do. I reckon, says Paul, that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be. I know we can take that to be future, but it's also present. we got the tremendous statement of Jesus, He shall glorify me, shall take of the things of mine and show them unto you. So wherever the Holy Spirit takes of the word and there's a sense of pleasure and enjoyment, perhaps even of ecstasy in knowing the things of the Lord. It's this work of the Holy Spirit causing this glory to be revealed in us. And friends, sometimes when the Spirit moves in a special way, we'll know about that glory. There was a stonemason that John Wesley came across in his day. He was a very godly man and John Wesley said to him, you ought to leave your quarry and go into the villages of Yorkshire and preach in every place. Go out as one of my lay preachers. And this stonemason, and you can get his life in the reprints of the early Methodist preachers or Wesley's veterans, as I think this edition is called. This man went, he had tremendous power with God. Tremendous power with God. And John Wesley records in his journal, he came to a village where this man had been to and he had preached there three weeks before. And the village came to hear him preach. And as he preached, the power of God, the Spirit of God fell upon them. And they were just lifted up into another world. John Wesley says three weeks later, a visitor rode in among them. It was himself. He says the villagers realized for the first time in three weeks they were still upon earth and not in heaven. They thought they'd been taken away. When a stranger rode in, they said, we, we're still upon earth. My, can the Spirit so lift up a congregation that they're in another world? I was preaching with Harry Sutton some time ago. He's considered 
to be the greatest. He's the secretary of the Church Missionary Society working in South South Africa, in, in South America, called SAMS. And he's considered the greatest authority on the church life in South America for, what's that, for what that's worth. In that message that evening, he said, The church in South America has multiplied from 4 million souls to 19 million souls in recent years. He says, why? He says, I think I can explain it. He said, this is the reason why the church has multiplied in South America from 4 million to 19 million souls. He says, when you step into those services, it's like being taken into heaven itself. You don't want to come down. And people are seeing the faces of Christians and hearing the testimonies, and then they go into those services themselves, and they, they're just taken away. You know, when we are asked by Pastor Pierpoint to come and pray at 7 o'clock for the services, don't only pray that the Lord would give a blessing in this service. Why not pray big prayers? Why not pray for the Spirit of God to come down in the kind of revival that will lift people up to a sense of tremendous glory? Tom Williams was a man who could scarcely read or write. But he was a very close friend of mine and he used to tell me in some way the Lord had so knit his heart to mine, although he was an old man, we used to spend Thursday evenings together and he said, I feel I can share my experiences of God with you that I've never felt right to share with anyone else. And he told me amazing stories of the blessings of God. And I remember one Thursday evening he told me this story. You know, Douglas, he said, every night after the 1904 revival we had a prayer meeting at about 8 o'clock. And I was working the night shift, which started at 10 o'clock, so I liked to be there just after 9 o'clock. So I thought I'd pop in in my working clothes for the 8 o'clock prayer meeting, leave by 9 to be at work for the 10 o'clock night shift. We did this every night. So about one night, he said, we turned into that prayer meeting. We started to pray. And that's about the last he remembers for 10 days and 10 nights. He said, suddenly, says, the Spirit came down. And I was so strengthened by the Holy Spirit, I praised the Lord Jesus for ten days and ten nights and never even lost my voice. They were taken up to glory. Now, I don't know how you explain that. Why didn't they get tired? Why didn't they want food? They were just taken away. And lost in wonder, love and praise. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones testified to an experience of the Spirit some years ago when after 30 years of preaching nearly in London in Westminster Chapel he says then for the first time I realized what it meant to rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory the Spirit came all the writings of John Flavel they're almost impossible to read one day that great Puritan expositor was sitting at the well in the garden when he said the Spirit came upon him and he was compelled to write this. I learned more of Jesus Christ in that one hour than in, pre in the previous 60 years of diligent Bible study. The Spirit had come. John Flavel would have been the last man to say, don't you bother to study your Bible. This is what the Spirit uses. But he's now talking about the revelation of the glory to his soul. And yet there's a goal to be reached. There's a goal to be reached. I hope there's no one here who says, you know, we believe in the clean heart. We believe in the fullness of the Holy Spirit. And once you've had it, you see, there's already, when you've used that kind of expression, the note of finality. You've had it. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. You've only started. You've only started. When Britain was within hours almost of defeat at the German Air Force, the Prime Minister of that time, Winston Churchill, made a statement to the nation. He says, this is not the end. This is not even the beginning of the end. It's just the end of the beginning. The Battle of Britain was over, but the war was still to be. I can kneel 
I can say, Lord, I take the Holy Ghost. It begins. It's not the end. Brethren, sisters, it's not even the beginning of the end. It's just the end of the crisis, just the end of the beginning. You've begun trusting. And there's still a goal to be reached. I've never, never, never heard expounded Ephesians 3.19 that you might be filled unto all the fullness of God. I know there are those who say it's the same as Ephesians 5.18 Be filled with the Spirit But it's not true Something much more And there's no end I don't know if you've ever gone up to Buffalo And stood at the sides of Niagara I've had the privilege of standing at the side of Niagara And I've stood at the side of even the mightier Victoria and as I stood at the thunderclap of Victoria or Niagara, whichever one, you know, you can see that mighty cataract. Yeah. And I can take my little cup, <laughs> and it's full to overflowing, but there's still more to follow. There's still more to follow. And I can keep on putting my little cup, and I'll never exhaust the supply. I was a little grieved when we had the touch of the spirit and some of the deacons, some people came forward, had come forward before and I remember one of the deacons saying rather contemptuously he wasn't too happy about these people that came forward the second time to the altar. But you know some of those people, they felt a need of more. They felt more. I don't despise the second comers and the third comers and the fourth comers. When I was a father, I suppose my children must have come to me perhaps 20 times as Daddy, I'm not sure if Jesus is in my heart. I didn't give them a clip across the ear and get on with your schoolwork. You've trusted Jesus two years. If you get on with it, stop coming again. I always commenced afresh as if they'd never spoken to me. And what joy it always gave me to just speak to them about the Lord Jesus. I said, now are you trusting now? She said, I think he's there now, Daddy. They came a year later. We just begin again. So the Lord just seals it. There's always a goal to be reached, always more. Well, we've only touched upon something of the Holy Spirit tonight. This isn't the end of the meeting, it's just one of a series. Let's just commit it halfway like this to the Lord. Tomorrow evening I want to look at another aspect of the Holy Spirit. Tonight, what he is to us. I want to look tomorrow evening at more with more challenge, I suppose, at what he wants to do through us. You just pray about those meetings. Our Heavenly Father... The Lord Jesus isn't upon earth, we're not in the days of his flesh. But these are the days of the Holy Spirit and we thank thee for it. As we understand thy word in this dispensation of the Holy Spirit, we can expect him to fulfill the promises of the word. Now Lord, if there is anyone here tonight who perhaps never really understood quite clearly before they were to take, they were to seize hold of, they were to apprehend by faith the Holy Spirit, to receive the Holy Spirit, which they that believe on him are to receive ghost since you believe. Then he'll come as a guest that remains, and he'll come a gospel to relay, and his graces to reveal, and a glory to reveal to us. And, O oh Lord, still to show us there's a goal to be reached, there's no end to the blessings thou hast to those that walk humbly before thee. Take of us here tonight as we commit ourselves to thee afresh and pray that thou'll continue with us and bless thy word to us fulfill thy will in and through us because we ask it for Jesus sake Amen Amen been asked to sing 270, fill me now. We've suggested a hover on me, Holy Spirit, bathe my trembling heart and brow. Fill me with thy hallowed presence.
cleanse and comfort, bless and save me. Be the bed by a heart and a brow. Thou art comforting and saving. Fear me not.